Scores high. Or as high as the heavens are above of the earth. So great is his love for those who fear him. And as far, and as far as the east is from the west. So far has he's removed our transgression. He has done. Sing it. Church, we're going to sing that next song, Burning Me. Burning Me, Burning Me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Burning Me, Burn. Burning Me. Your words like a fire. Your words like a fire burning in my soul. Burn up the dross. Bring more the burn in me. Burn in me. Burn in me. Let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Burn in me. like a fire. You feel like a fire. You feel like a fire. 
fire shut up in my bones consume me lord make me burn in me burn in me burn in me let the fire of the holy one burn in me burn in me burn in me let the fire of the holy one your words like a fire We're going to slow things down this evening. We're going to lift our voices and our hands and sing that song, Christ is Enough. Christ is my reward. And Christ is my reward. And all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world. And now there's nothing Through every trial and through every trial, my soul will see no turning back. I've been sent. Come on, church, let's lift the voices and sing it. Christ is enough. And Christ is enough for me. Christ is my all in all Christ my all in all my joy in my salvation and his hope will never fail and his hope will never fail heaven is our home through every storm So we'll see Jesus is here to God be. Come on, church, let's sing it. Christ is enough. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need. Sing that again. Christ is enough. And Christ is enough for me. Enough for me. Everything I need is in you. I have decided. Jesus, no 
turning back. No, the cross before me, the cross before me, the world behind me. No, yes, hallelujah. The cross before me, the cross before. church we're going to sing that last song you are holy we serve a mighty god this evening thank you jesus come on church let's lift the voices and sing i saw the lord i saw the lord Seated on his throne, he was clothed in glory. He was clothed in glory, and exalted high, and exalted high. The train of his robe, in the train of his robe.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God. Thank God. We want to go before the Lord. We're praying numbers of needs that we want to bring before the Lord. Praying again for our brother Rich Kennedy for a quick and full recovery. Also praying for Richard Paola. Uh, and just needs God to touch him and help him. Uh, has been in and out of the hospital and just really needs a miracle in his body. And so praying for him as well. Praying for our sister Pat for complete recovery there and all that is involved. We're praying and believing God for our new converts, especially for uh, those that read dedicated their lives or, or gave their lives to Jesus really recently, praying that God's grace and hand would be upon them. His spirit would make himself real to them and they would uh, serve him in his purposes, praying as well for all that God is doing in our upcoming outreaches uh, and uh, our, uh, those teams we're sending out and believing God for great things. We're praying for our mother church in Prescott, believing God to help them. Pastor Greg, uh, uh, he's in what uh, we would affectionately call when I was on staff, Conference Row. It's conference after conference this week. Uh, it's Jacksonville and uh, Volugda, Russia's conferences are going on. Uh, and then uh, in this time, the Cape will be there, uh, Toronto, McMinnville, uh, numbers of conferences that will be happening and so want to keep them in uh, your prayers and so we're praying for them the staff there pastor jesse all that's going on we're also believing god to help uh, the churches uh, uh, like i mentioned north carolina jacksonville is in conference right now I want to pray for god's grace uh, and glory there a number of our people are there and so I want to just pray god would help them praying as well for all that god wants to do in uh, the upcoming cape cod conference pastor campo pastor grenier there 40th anniversary celebration is going to be this weekend praying for them believing God to help uh, pour out his spirit uh, there also praying for uh, the La Valleys in Canada in Toronto not only do they have a conference in May but they also are in desperate need of a building and so pray that God gives them an open door uh, prices are crazy there in the gen in the uh, greater Toronto area uh, they, they easily this building would have been 10 to 20 times what we paid for it in that area and so they need a miracle and I know a God that happens to be really good in miracles and so we're going to pray and ask him to help them and uh, believe God to pour out his spirit there we're praying for our outreach churches praying uh, for uh, the stoles as they're getting ready with their building for their opening and so praying for that as well as praying for the Van Epps in Greece God's favor grace there all that God wants to do in Brockport the Harris's believe in God for good reports out of these uh, churches we're praying as well for our nation our city desperate need for Jesus praying for all that God wants to do in uh, the world uh, in uh, local churches Buffalo and Troy and such keep those in your prayers believe God to help them as well as the war in the Ukraine how many of you have needs on your heart and you lift them out speak them up we're gonna believe God for good things this evening uh, I'm gonna ask our brother Steve Stoll to come and seal us in prayer let's go before the Lord Jesus father right now God your grace your hand God dominion and glory God I'm asking you God to move and minister God in every need life and heart God move in the conference in Jacksonville God pour out your spirit God God I pray God for all that you want to do God in our midst oh God established God in Jesus name God amen God we come before you tonight God lifting up those in need God of healing right now our brother rich God for a supernatural touch God for Cobra's father God Richard God that you're gonna move in that life God that you're gonna heal those God that are not here tonight God we thank you God for what you're doing God those that have been recently saved God bring them into this place God give them a revelation God of who you are God we pray God for the conferences that are going on God that you're gonna move there pour out your spirit God open doors that no man can shut God we thank you God as we prepare God for the Easter egg hunt coming up God that you're gonna anoint that outreach God that people are gonna be saved God brought to a place of repentance God we thank you for what you're doing God in our baby churches Greece Rockport and Syracuse, God, anoint them, God. Give them favor in their cities, God. Give them converts, God. God, we thank you, God, for what you're going to do here tonight, God. Speak into our lives, God. Do not let us leave the same, God. Do a miracle, God, in each and every life in this place, God. We thank you for who you are. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God this evening. Father, we love you, God. We praise you. 
Thank God. Amen. Say hello to someone tonight. Share the victory. Tell me you're glad they're here. Praise the Lord Jesus. We want to welcome you out to our midweek service here at the Potter's House. We're very, very glad you are with us. Really do count it a privilege and excited for what God is going to do. And we just want to let you know some of the announcements uh, that we're, uh, things we've got going on this Sunday at 9.30. We begin a Sunday school series that's actually on video. It's called The Blessed Life. And uh, this is an older series. It's been out for a while, but I realize many of you have never seen this, and it is just an outstanding uh, a look at uh, how, how, if you want the blessing of God in your life, things you can do to help that along. And so look forward to that. That'll be 9.30 this Sunday morning. Then 10.30 in our Sunday morning service, our brother Steve Stoll will be ministering. Seven, uh, six o'clock in our Sunday evening service will be Corey Kilpatrick uh, with uh, prayer at six o'clock. Uh, seven o'clock we'll be back next week, uh, prayer meeting at six o'clock. And so look forward to that. The youth group will be meeting on the 31st. And so if you have any questions about that, you can see Jeremy or Annika stole about that. On the 1st, we have a team going to Syracuse. There is a list out there. If you want to be a part of that, please put your name on the list. And then uh, also on the 8th of April, we will be having an Easter egg hunt here at the building. And so we will have flyers. Do we have flyers for that now? They are here, and so, uh, glory. So you can take them, invite uh, families especially. Uh, we're going to have a great time with that. Uh, that will be at 2 o'clock, and then uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have the kids go out and get the Easter egg, but in each Easter egg is going to be a raffle ticket. And then the adults will have to come back with their raffle tickets. We'll draw and we'll see who has it. It'll also give us a chance to share the gospel with them. And so that's our strategy with that. Uh, 9th of April will be Easter. And then that Sunday morning service, we will be having our communion service. And so uh, that's always a great time. 10 through the 14th of, August, of April will be the Northeast Bible Conference on Cape Cod. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can put your name on the list out there. That'd be helpful. And then on the 8th through the 12th of May is the Toronto Bible Conference. And uh, we'll have a sign-up list for that uh, uh, shortly. It'll be up for Sunday. Also on the 29th of April, there will be an outreach team to... Rockport. Amen. That's all the announcements we have. I hope you followed them all. And I only went about five weeks out. So thank God for that. Amen. Let's uh, have the ushers come. We want to receive the offering of the evening. We uh, just, uh, again, just having Tony chase here and, and being able to show him the building and such, uh, he was so encouraged. We are just so set for what God wants to do in the very, very near future. And so I believe great things are off, just right around the corner for us. And so you remember your tithes, your offerings besides. Let God bless your life. Brian, would you ask God's blessing on the gift and the giver?
one last time, Burning Me. Burning Me, Burning Me, let the fire of the Holy One burn in me. Praise the Lord. Thank you, platform workers and musicians. And by the way, for, th- for you guys, there will be song service practice on the 2nd, right after the Sunday morning service, April 2nd. Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles. I'm almost glad that Steve won't be in the room for this opening illustration. Not because, uh, just because it would put maybe, I don't know, salt in his wound, and I don't intend to do that with this illustration. But it is what it is. In ESPN, the uh, entertainment and sports network, um, did a uh, documentary, and they called it The Four Falls of Buffalo. From 1990 through 1993, the Buffalo Bills went to the Super Bowl four times. And all four times, they lost. And two of the times they lost, they lost when they should have won clearly. This was never more true than the very first one that they were in, in Super Bowl 25 with the New York Giants. With eight seconds left, Scott Norwood was the kicker. And they were in field goal range. And with that field goal, a 47-yard field goal, they would have won the game. But he missed. No one probably felt more of the weight of this than Norwood himself. Even 20 years after the attempt, he described to ESPN, he said, sorrow, I guess, and disappointment in letting down my teammates. There's no one on the field uh, that battles with you. I get choked up thinking about it, putting myself back in that situation. But what Norwood wasn't ready for, when the team came back to Buffalo, 30,000 fans, as they're affectionately called, the Mafia, met them at the airport. And they were screaming Norwood's name. They chanted, we want Scott. We want Scott. Now, not to crucify him. He, he describes the scene this way. We got back in town, and I didn't know exactly what to expect. What I really wanted to do was remain behind the scenes. But the chant intensified. I was not expecting to be called to the front like that. I had to speak off the total, uh, top of my mind really quickly. And in that sense, it's when the truest feelings arise. The documentary uh, uh, shows Scott with a, a time mic in his hand telling the crowd, I know I've I never felt more love than I do right now. Expecting or maybe even deserving, as the commentator said it, of condemnation, Norwood found a small taste of amazing grace. I want to talk to you about grace, because that is a very good picture of grace. When someone had actually let down and should have maybe even deserved condemnation, he got love and hope. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 4. The Bible says, but God, who is so rich in mercy, he loved us so much, even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in future ages as examples of incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. 
God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. I want to talk to you firstly about amazing grace. Now, we were, I was with uh, Evangelist uh, Chase, and we, were, we went to breakfast one morning in uh, um, Cracker Barrel. And they had a sign that said, you know, as the lyrics of Amazing Grace. They actually had a chorus, a verse that I had never heard and asked Tony, you heard that? He said, no, I've never heard that verse either. But we were talking about Amazing Grace, and I said to him, that's kind of the unofficial national Christian anthem, Amazing Grace. It's kind of like if any church, anyone knows a song, you go anywhere in the world, you pretty much hear this translated. It's kind of like our unofficial national Christian anthem. And it's there because we are saved by grace. Our text says that. The word grace actually means divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life it has to do with words like acceptable, benefit, favor, grace, gracious, joy, liberality, pleasure, thankfulness, and worthiness. It's used 156 times in the New Testament, in the Greek word of this. It is important to always remember, as our text says, you're a sinner saved by grace. Not because you were special, not because you were able to jump through a certain amount of religious hoops uh, and impress God, not because you were better looking, smarter, more into well, all the things uh, that the world would put the value, not because of that. And I'm not saying you're not, I'm just saying that's not why you're saved. We're saved because God's influence undeserving influence while you were a sinner. You did more than just miss a kick in your life. You actually missed the mark totally. That's what the word sin means. Sin means to miss the mark. It's not even that you were close to the target is the impression. All have sinned and fallen short I worked at a day camp, I've told you this before, and I, at the day camp we had horseback riding. I taught kids how to sail, but there were swimming lessons, and there, were, uh, there was uh, arts and crafts, and there was uh, archery that kids would take, and some of them were very good. I was never very good at archery. I hated archery, because I would always pull back that bow, and I, that, bow, that uh, string would crash into my forearm and hurt like, oh my gosh, it would hurt. And so I'd hold my wrist funny. And instead of holding it like this, I'd hold it like this to get my... And you can't really aim well when you do it like that. And so I, I just wasn't good. And that's, so I would shoot and I would sin all the time in, in the archery range. I mean, I'd fall short, I'd, you know, so I'd lift it and go 20 feet beyond the target. and so I'd never hit the targets. That's what the word sin means. You're not hitting the target. You're not even getting close. And that's why I think this illustration of the kicker is such a good illustration of grace. When he missed, he still was received and loved. We've missed the target. God's target. Righteousness. Just take the Ten Commandments and go through them. I'm sure you broke at least two. At least, right? Romans 2, 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? It's God's goodness. It's his grace on your heart that drew you to him. Not you waking up one day and saying, you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to get saved. God drew you. Some of you, when you, God drew you, you weren't really looking to be drawn. My wife came to church at Easter. She loves Easter because she got saved on Easter. She came to Easter just to get her parents off her back so she could say she went to church and it wasn't for her. And God just met with her that day. 
God has a way of dealing with us. Grace is also to change us. God doesn't just save us and leave us that way. His desire is to change us into His image, that reflection of God's influence on our heart that comes out. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, for the grace of God that has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we were instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures that we should uh, live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. That God changes us. And there's a couple of hindrances, a couple of lies. One lie that is out there is that uh, you can live any way you want because you're under grace. Isn't that wonderful? You can be, uh, you know, an axe murderer and still be a Christian as long as you do it in love. And people will say, well, this this shows just how forgiving and gracious God is. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Well, then, should we keep on sinning so God can show more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? But there are people who teach that we're under grace all the time. We're just under grace. It doesn't matter what you do, how you live, how you act. Uh, You're good. But see, true grace is changing us. True grace is taking us and making us into the people that God wants us and desires us to be. Another teaching of grace is that it will remove all bad decisions and consequences you make in your life. You'll make bad decisions, and grace is supposed to just wipe away all of the consequences. And that's not true. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17, looking at each one, uh, other, looking, uh, look after each, uh, uh, each other, so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up and troubles you, corrupting many. Make sure that no immoral or godless like Esau who traded his birthright as the firstborn for a single meal. For you know that afterwards when he wanted to inherit uh, his father's blessing, he was rejected. It was too late for uh, repentance even though he begged for it with bitter tears. His bad decision wasn't going to be erased by grace. The consequences of it didn't wipe it away. Yes, he could be forgiven. Yes, you see a, a bit of repentance in his life that he comes back to, East, to Jacob uh, 20 years later. Instead of killing him, he hugs him. He says, let me build you a house. Uh, tell you what, anybody that says that to you, it would be a real blessing, wouldn't it? I mean, this guy's changed. But he's not going to get back what he lost. And thirdly, Grace is not for you to do your will and tag Jesus' name on it. This is what some people try to do. Jude chapter 1 verse 4, For I say that some ungodly people have wormed their way into the churches, saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. And the condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they have denied our only Master and Lord. Jesus Christ. Basic thought is, you know what? You can do whatever you want, and God's grace will be on it. I had a, my brother-in-law was saved. He was a good kid. He really was a really good kid. And he uh, he got into this uh, 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 breakdancing group back when breakdancing was kind of the thing before everybody had to go to the emergency room because they're breaking the wrists and all that. And so they would do this Christian breakdancing thing. And I'll tell you what, they would get crowds. People like this. They would, the crowds would come to this and all that. And so they ended up working and going to a Christian festival and, and working and getting and meeting some people and uh, met one of the guys from a very original Christian group called Sweet Comfort or, uh, and uh, uh, Rick Boa. And uh, he began to tell them what you need to do is get eight by ten glossies of yourself and sell it to all the little girls. And that way you can make some money and buy some costume and you can do that. 
and it was like it was all about self. And it so turned off my brother-in-law that he, he actually left the faith. He recently rededicated his life. We're trying to get him into the Oceanside Church. If you're watching, Adam, we love you. We're praying for you. But God won't bless just self-will. He's not going to help you in your own endeavors. He's only going to help you with grace in His endeavors. These are three mistakes of growing in grace. But the reality is we need more grace. There's not one of us in here who has enough of grace. Grace is never given in excess. But it is there and available. Our text in verse 7 makes a very interesting statement. It says... That so that God can point to us in the future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of his grace. The thought there we're going to look at and, and really examine in a few minutes is that it is unexhaustible. It is, a, it is not a limited amount of grace. All of us, when we think of riches, they're, they're limited. We've all heard the horrifying stories of people who win the lottery and in six months, eight months, two years, they're declaring bankruptcy. Tens of millions of dollars and they just throw it away. Say, so how would they do that? Well, the first thing they believe is it won't ever end. And it does. The only one who can seem to spend without it ever ending is the government. And that's going to come to an end. But God has an unlimited supply of grace. Unlimited to help you. Because not only is it amazing grace, it's enabling grace. Enabling grace is going to cause not just the sinner to be saved, but how we live for God. Living for God takes grace. Paul said, But whatever I am now, it is because God poured out His special favor on me, and not without results, for I have worked harder than any other of the apostles. Yet it was not I, but God working through me by His grace. He tells Paul later, or Paul writes later that the Lord had told him about his thorn in his side when he said, Lord, take this thorn away. And God speaks to him in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 12, 9, my grace is all you need. My power is in your weakness. It means that we should be looking for God's grace. Not just to use to cover a sin, or, but to, for what you need to do in your life. In your relationships, in your finances, in every area of life, we pray for people to have traveling mercies or traveling grace. We actually call it, when you pray over the meal, who is going to say grace. The reasons we do that is because the word there is we want God to help us for the future. Our text says that God's, going, God's raising us up in realms to show uh, uh, the goodness of what He's done for us in the future. That He's going to point to us in the future. Now, part of this is heavenly. Part of this is going to be eternity. Part of this is an angel does not understand redemption because they cannot be redeemed. An angel that sins is lost. But human beings, God has shown and chosen to have mercy upon us. And He's going to point to this in eternity. That we are those who serve Him, not because that is simply what we were created to do, which is part of it, but because also we chose to do that. Because of the influence on our hearts. Thus the issue to grow in grace. Luke chapter 2 verse 52, it says Jesus grew in a number of things, and one of those was favor or grace with God. Peter writes in first 
In 2 Peter, rather, his last verse, uh, 3.18, rather you must grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace is something you can grow in. It's a maturity in the things of God. It's not just God helping you and doing everything for you. You know, I, uh, you know, I don't know if you noticed this. There's a lot of babies around here. Just saying, in case you haven't noticed, there are just a lot of babies, right? Yeah, and, and the moms here know you have to do everything for them. I mean, everything. Right? You've got to feed them. They're, they cry. They, don't, they can't tell you why. They're crying. You try to feed them. They're not hungry. They you try to change them. They don't need it. It's like, why are you upset? You don't know. And they start teething. They drool everywhere. Some of them, it's like, man, you could solve the drought in, in Sierra, in the Sahara Desert or something. You drool so much, right? And so you just get all the babies together and the teething babies, and right, their drought problem would be solved. But they, they thought, you know, you got to do everything. Well, God, but there comes a point where you don't have to. My wife goes over and watches our grandkids. And now that the youngest is six, it's so much easier. Right? The oldest is going to be ten and very shortly. And the, the next one, she'll be eight shortly. And, and they, can do, they can dress themselves. They, they, they don't need help when it comes time to either cut their food or use the bathroom or anything like that. They can handle that all on their own. Growing in grace is now you're not relying on God to do what you should be doing for yourself. Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.1, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God has given you in Christ Jesus. There comes the point where you need to be the one doing what you need to do. That's what God's grace is for, that you're growing in it. That no longer is it just God making up for your lack of prayer, but God's now using your prayers to touch other people. It's not just God helping you through your, your, your fiasco of no budget and no, you know, that God uses and helps you through your finances. That you make the decision, I'm going to budget now. He doesn't have to keep doing miracle after miracle after miracle for you every month. That's growing in the grace of God. It also has to do with confidence in our relationship with God. That we know God is going to help us. God is going to do. God is going to move. God is going to speak. That we can have that confidence in God that we know that, you know what, it's, it's re relying on God's grace. Acts chapter 13, verse 43, And many of the Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. You don't outgrow the grace of God. You don't get so mature that you take care of it. This is what happened to the Hebrews. So they just began to fall back into their religious rituals. But relying on the grace of God, growing in the grace of God. That you know what? God is going to help me, but I still need to pray. God is going to teach me, but I still need to read His Word. God is going to speak to me, but I still need to have a heart that is open to what He wants to say. God moves through grace. This word actually, for the incredible wealth of the riches, is the word that we get, it's the Greek word mega. We can relate to that. Europe loved it. Every, we had stores, you know, Mega this and Mega that, Mega Mart. And it sold electronics. It was like Best Buys. One commentator said, Riches being added to grace denotes the valuableness of it, as well as the plentiful abundance. Do you value the grace of God? If you do, You'll hold it in esteem. It's something that you consider worthy and precious. Ephesians 1, 7, So in the riches and kindness 
and grace that he purchased our freedom with his blood of his son and forgave our sins. Grace should make you want to do right. I have seen Christians, genuine Christians who want to do their self-will, maybe have a little sin in their life, and they step out of the grace of God. Now, they're not backslidden. They're not selling drugs on the corner. They're not cheating on their husband and wife. They're not, you know, they're not evil people, but they step out of God's grace. I'll tell you a couple of things about God's grace. One, it has a timing. When I was a missionary, there was a certain grace in my life I don't need anymore. There was a timing of that grace. There was a timing of parenting. God puts a grace on your life that, you know what? We're empty nesters now. We don't need that grace. There's a timing of it. That God gives you that as you need it. There's an old expression that says, grace is never in excess. There's abundance of it, but God doesn't give you more than you need, but he gives you what you need for the moment. And so there's timing involved. I'm not a missionary anymore. I don't need that grace that I needed when I was overseas. And there's a location for it. There's people who they move out of the location God wants them to be. And then they find that the grace of God is not there like they wanted it to be. They were, they were where, when they were in the place God wanted them, there was a tremendous favor on their life. But they move away. Even if they can do it for all the seemingly right reasons. In Prescott, Arizona, the leadership church of our fellowship, people, one couple I, I remember, they moved there. And I, it was like, I knew their pastor. I knew this wasn't going to be good. He told me, he said, you know what, they've got this, you know. I'm like, okay. Well, things blew up bad for them. That I believe if they had actually stayed where God's plan for their life was, it would have been a very, very different outcome. Grace is for a timing. Grace is for a place. That's why you need to make the right decisions. Titus 3, 6, and 7. For he has generously poured out his Spirit upon us, that through Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, our Savior, because of his grace, he has made us right in the sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. When you step outside of those things, those realms, timing and place, you won't have the confidence in the grace of God. You're on your own. And that's a scary place to be. Grace should also make you want to tell others. Why do you witness? You need the Holy Spirit to witness. That's, you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is evangelistical. When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll be witnesses to me in, in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But also is the grace of God. I was just a sinner who deserved hell. What I deserved. What you deserved. You did things. Now, you might say, oh, I did things I didn't know. Well, yeah, but what about the things you did know? Acts chapter 20, verse 24, but my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. This is the words of the Apostle Paul. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. It's the grace of God that makes me want to tell others. You know what God did for me? Little old me? A 17-year-old messed up kid? Me? Family problems, sin problems. Me? That God 
met me, dealt with me, forgave me, had patience with me. Because grace is how God deals with man. This is what our text tells us. You're saved by grace. You grow in grace. And you never get beyond that we're saved by grace. Never get beyond that. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Pre- Preachers, used to tell a story that illustrated the good things that we receive from God and how they always come with the same perspective. When God forgives our sins, there's more forgiveness to follow. When He justifies us in, uh, justifies us in the righteousness of Christ, there's more to follow. When He adopts us into the family, there's more to follow. When He prepares us for heaven, there's more to follow. When He gives us grace to follow, there's more. Uh, when He gives us grace, there's more to follow. He helps us in our old age, and there's still more. To follow, he would always conclude this illustration saying that when we arrive in the world to come, there will still be more to follow. God's grace is how God deals with man. The grace of God, that term is actually used 24 times in the New Testament. It's used with words to begin, uh, to be given or to continue in, to contend for. That these are the terms that are used in the Bible that God gives us. Grace. Grace is so precious. Because this is what Jesus is a picture of. In the great prologue of John chapter 1. The first 14 verses, as he's saying, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And in verse 14, he says, and he was full of grace and truth. We knew him to be the Son of God. God's nature is grace. He doesn't have grace. He is grace. Just like he is love. He's, he doesn't have love. He is love. We have love. He is love. We can have grace. We can receive grace. He is grace. And that's why it's important to understand and appreciate. 24 times, 24 times, Paul uses this word grace in the book of, Eph- in the book of Ephesians. 24 times, favor, grace, bestow. He puts that out there because he wants you and I, he's writing to this church with this excitement about it. This emphasis on it. Grace. Grace. I close with this. Revelation tells us that when we get to heaven, we're going to take our crowns off. We're going to throw them at the feet of Jesus. And we're going to say three words. And they're not going to be I'm so great. They're not going to be, you know, I did this. They're going to be grace, grace, grace. We're saved by grace. We grow in grace. And when we get to heaven, we're going to know it's all by grace. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. You're here this evening, maybe you're not saved. Maybe you don't know the grace and the love and the forgiveness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He loves you so much. He died. You could be, you know, this this kicker, Scott Norwood, he missed a field goal. Life goes on. He's still married. He's still, you know, life, he still was a professional. But Bill's Mafia still even loved him. But our missing the mark was far more severe. It's going to take us to a devil's hell. But God in His mercy and in His grace reaches out, deals with our hearts to draw us back to Him. 
If you're here tonight, you're not right with God or you're, you're backslidden, you're away from God, you need to come to Jesus. I want you to slip up your hand. Say, pray for me. I need Jesus. I need to come home to God. I need forgiveness. I need His love. Grace. There's a lot of strange teachings about it. I can do whatever I want. I can sin anytime I want. Isn't God's grace sufficient? Oh, isn't that wonderful? It's a mistake. We're saved by grace. Thank God. Sinners saved by grace. And that should be an awe and a wonder to you. Like Esau, you can miss it. Time and location. Be praying, growing, continuing, being strong in the grace of God. By grace, we are saved. Let's all stand. We're going to open up these altars. Allow people to find a place to pray, talk to God, worship His name. I saw the Lord. There's nothing, nothing like the grace of God. Because it's God's influence on our hearts. It's like, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, some Baptist described it, and I'll just go with this. You know, it's like, it's almost like a hug from God. 
It's just God putting his mark on your life. And thank God, we need God's grace. Amen. You remember, we've got our services on Sunday, starting our new Sunday school series at 9.30, The Blessed Life. It's an outstanding series. Look forward to that. It's going to take us about six, seven weeks or so, and so it's going to be a great time. Look forward to that. Steve Stoll in the morning, Corey Kilpatrick in the evening. Thank God. Let's bow our heads. Go rejoicing. Logan, would you close us in prayer? Amen. The Lord bless you. Thank you.